Hello dragonflies, welcome back to Watercolor Jumpstart. I'm Lynn and today we have reached the point in the Watercolor Jumpstart curriculum where we get to make a little scene. Instead of just doing a brush exercise or a color exercise or learning to lay a wash, we're going to start putting some of our skills together to make small paintings. Now I don't want you to get carried away and um, decide that you're going to jazz yours up on the first try. We're going to work monochrome, which means just one color, different values of the same color. And we're going to just paint basically a silhouette. And I don't want you to get too complicated because we're also going to be learning a couple of little techniques for suggesting foliage. We're going to be practicing a little bit of dry brushing. We're going to be continuing to get command of laying a wash but this time within a defined shape instead of over the whole page. So I'll have to worry about where to start and stop. And that's enough to think about the first time you tackle this. But then you can take this idea and you can extend it and create, start creating small paintings of your own. So for now, please, as you go through this exercise, take my advice and don't try the very first time to put realistic color to everything. That's very tempting and, and everyone seems to want to do that but it really does create a lot of problems that we haven't talked about how to solve. So resist that temptation, stick with a single color, and hang with me in the next exercise, the next video, we'll actually start bringing in multiple colors. So let's get started on the Kayaker project. For the Kayaker project, you'll want to have a flat wash that you have already laid and is completely dry. If you don't know how to do that, you might want to back up a couple of videos in this curriculum and find the video that shows how to lay a flat and graded wash and learn how to do that and then save one of your flat washes for this exercise. It doesn't matter what color you use, but don't use a wash for this kayaker project that's too dark because we're going to transfer a drawing onto this paper and we want to be able to see our pencil marks. So probably nothing darker than this. You'll also need this photograph that we're going to use for reference. If you're watching this video on my website, there should be a link for downloading the photo either right before or right after this video. If you're watching on YouTube, you might want to hop over to dragonflyspiritstudio.com and in the search box type kayaker project and you should get a blog post that has this video embedded and a link for downloading the uh, photograph that you need. So I'm going to transfer some of this information notice I said some of this information to my paper by using the method we've used before I've scribbled on the back with a woodless graphite pencil and if you don't know how to transfer a drawing, there is also a video about how to do that. And I'm going to lay my photograph down on top of my paper that has a wash. And I think I'll stick just a little bit of tape on the corners to keep it from moving while I'm transferring my drawing. And now I don't want to draw every little detail here and in fact I don't want to draw anything except a silhouette for this project. So in particular in the kayaker the version that you download I changed it to black and white to help resist help you resist the temptation to paint every little detail here. There are yellow paddle blades and a yellow kayak and a blue PFD and we're going to ignore all of that and all we will do is trace the outside silhouette of the kayak, the kayakers, and their paddles. We'll also only trace an outside silhouette of the cliff face. And we don't want to trace every one of these little leaves on every little tree. First of all, that's way too much work. And secondly, you don't want to have a pencil line around your trees. And we don't need that information. The the marks that we transfer onto the watercolor paper are not a drawing in and of themselves. Think of them as landmarks that help you place things on the page. So I don't need to see every little 
branch on this tree to know roughly where to place the tree. It will be enough if I make a dotted line down a part of the trunk. And for the cliff, I don't really need to know where the top of every single tree is. We're not going to try to reproduce this exactly. We're just going to give the suggestion of some trees. So instead, I'm going to make a dotted line here where the sh shadows under the trees run into the shadows at the top of the cliff. I am not trying to draw a solid line and guess where the top of that cliff is. I'm just giving myself an indication that, okay, this is probably where, where I'll stop my tree technique and start laying my wash for the cliff. For the outside edge of the cliff, I can use a solid line, and I'm not being terribly precise. I'm just kind of jiggling it back and forth. And then again, for the water line, I don't want that to be a real defined line. It, it's hard to pick up in the photograph, and we understand it. So it can be hard to pick up where that line is in our painting, and we'll still understand it. So just a little dotted line there to help me figure out roughly where that wash is going to change from the cliff to the little bit of dry brushing I'm going to do down here. And that'll make more sense later. Then I also am going to trace just around the outer silhouette of my boat, the paddle blades, and the kayakers. To help you with this, I've got um, indicated in the, with blue marks on this photograph where I'm making my marks because I know it's hard to see on the actual um, video. All right, so I made mine nice and dark so you could see them. You don't need to make yours that dark if you don't want to. All right, so the first thing that uh, we need to do is talk about a couple of techniques for suggesting the texture of trees or foliage. Let's put our little reference photo up here where we can see it. And I am going to use a piece of this stuff that looks like saran wrap. What this is, is um, it's called banding film. It's a packing material. It's used, it sticks to itself just like saran wrap. It's used to hold things together when um, Things are shipped, you'll see it wrapped around entire pallets of goods um, in stores. And it's basically the same thing as saran wrap. The big difference is this stuff doesn't have to be made under food safe conditions, so it's way cheaper. You can buy it in office supply stores or home improvement stores, wherever they have the cardboard boxes and bubble wrap and things like that for packing. You can also use other sorts of plasticky materials like I could tear a little section out of a plastic grocery bag. You can try wax paper, freezer paper, other sorts of plastic bags. For this technique, basically what you want is something where the water will bead up, the paint will bead up on the surface. And now take the back of some other painting that you've practiced on and give yourself a little practice sheet off on the side. Remember, we don't want to try things for the very first time on our actual painting. We want to test them out over on a little practice sheet. I always do this, even though I've done this technique hundreds of times, I will still test out, let's see, do I want to use this kind of plastic, or do I want to use this kind of plastic? What am I going to use today? I want to try them out over here on my scrap paper and not on the painting that I'm painting today. So I'll try it, I think, with the banding film. So in keeping with what we said before, we are going to keep everything the same color. So I'm going to use the same blue that I used for this wash, which happens to be Indent Throne Blue, and it doesn't matter whatever color you used you're going to use the same color for all your washes. So if you used Quinn Rose, then use Quinn Rose for everything here. All right, so what I do is I put some of this paint on my piece of plastic and I kind of wiggle it around to get it broken up. I want it to beat up. And then 
I put it on the page and press and I get a broken application of paint. Now that by itself doesn't necessarily look like trees, but if I do that repeatedly, especially if I am patient enough to let some of the first pass dry before I put the next pass on, I can build up texture that sort of suggests the tree line. I'll put more of this up at the or put less of this up at the top, do it just a few times to show the upper part of the trees. And then down here where there's more undergrowth, I'm going to add more of my stamping. So what I'm doing is just using the banding film as a method of stamping the paint onto the paper. You don't have to always apply paint with a brush. You can also try wadding up the banding film like this and pressing it into your paint and stamping with it that way. This might be a little bit more convenient for these small areas. So I like that. I think that looks looks nice and um, tree-like. So I'm going to come over and put this on the top part. But before I do that, I want to think a minute about what will happen when I make this transition between the open area up here and the cliff. Suddenly, I'm only worried about silhouette, but suddenly I no longer see any light peeking through when I get down in this area. But notice, it's not a straight line. There are shadows that come up into the lower edge of the foliage, some places here where the foliage pretty much blocks out all the light, and then other places that are more open. So when I work my paint up into the bottoms of my trees, I want it to be irregular. And then I'm going to come all the way down with that wash, laying um, in the silhouette of the, the cliff. And when I get to the bottom, there's a little bit of brokenness. It's a little bit hard to see here, but you'll see it on your photo. A little bit of brokenness and I want to create that sort of broken edge as I go into the water too. So how will I do that? Well, let's take our little test sheet again and think about as I'm coming down the cliff, I'll be laying down solid paint, but then, oh look, if I let my brush get a little dry and lay it on its side, um, so I'm allowing the belly of the brush to rub across the paper and the tip of the brush is really not touching. This is called dry brushing. It takes some practice. Every brush is a little different. So that's why I'm over here trying it on my sample sheet of paper. But I think this would work well if I come down from my cliff and paint my reflection. And then on this edge, as I go out towards the kayaker, I just give a little dry brush stroke. So that's help me figure out how I want to handle the trees and how I want to handle this little broken stuff in the water. Now I have to think about the sequence that I'm going to paint things. Well, we've got already our background wash, um, the wash that will represent the sky color. Notice that the water is very slightly darker. Even the light parts of the water is very slightly darker. And then this area, the trees plus the cliff plus the reflection is darker yet and the kayaker also is darker yet. They're about the same. So we really have a pale, a middle value, and a dark to work with. And we want to put them down in that order because in watercolor, because it's transparent, I can't layer a lighter value on top of a darker value and have it show up unless I'm going to add white, which we aren't um, doing right now. So the first thing I have to do um, on my painting is add the next wash for the water. Now we didn't draw a line for that because I think we can all just sort of eyeball this. Notice that the water line, the horizon of the water line is right about where the kayakers heads are. So we'll just put our water in and notice I paint right through my kayakers. 
that's just fine because they are going to be darker so they'll show up on top of my water now over on this side I don't want a little line at the base of my cliff and I'm going to be putting much darker color over this whole area so I just smudge out the rest of this wash because even though this is a fairly pale, pale wash if I allowed a line like this to create to be created at the base of my cliff you'd actually probably see that through some of the darker layers of paint so now I have to let this dry before I can do my kayakers and before I can do the base of my cliff or things will get all mushy here if I want to have a clean line. So let's all go off and have a cup of tea and we'll come back in a few moments when this is dry and we'll do the next step. All right, so we're back and our water um, wash has dried and it's time for us to do the next layer. Now something that confuses people sometimes when I talk about the different washes and layers of wash, a wash is an area of color that you have all connected at one time. It's all wet at the same time. So there was a wash that covered the whole page. Then there was a wash that covered this darker area that was all wet at the same time and it connected. Now we're going to do a wash that connects the trees, the cliff, and the reflection in the water. So that means we're not going to stop and have little lines and boundaries between them because on the photograph you can see things run into each other and if you allow that to happen in your paintings they'll look much more natural than if you go I'm going to look really close and see where the top of that and have a little line there where the cliff stops and then another little line where the water starts. So we need to mix some more of our blue wash. And I'll mix this one a little darker. We're going to we're going to go a little bit darker with our cliff. We've figured out how we want to handle the suggestion of the foliage there and I'm just going to use my photograph sort of as inspiration so that I don't make my trees too mechanical. I'll I'll kind of look at these and see oh some of them lean this way and there are bigger gaps and smaller gaps and that one sticks up a little farther. So I'll use my banding film. I'm going to wad it up. Get it wet. Before I stick it on my page I want to test and see is my paint about the right consistency. That looks pretty good. So Using my photo for inspiration, I start making some tree-ish foliage-like marks on the page with my banding film. And I'm not trying to go and copy exactly what's in the photo. I'm just trying to give the suggestion of some trees. No one else knows what those trees looked like. Now I'm getting down towards my cliff and I'm making my foliage a little bit thicker. And I think I've reached the point where I can start painting this area where no light is peeking through. So I'm going to kind of wiggle my brush up into my trees. And then just bring that right on down into my cliff. It might be easier to approach this cliff edge with from the other side just kind of jiggling my brush back and forth and letting the jiggles make that irregularity. If you aren't comfortable switching your brush to the, your, to your other hand you can turn the paper over so that you can use the point of your brush and just kind of wiggle it to make that rough cliff edge. And I'm just going to come right on down the page. Remember we want to keep this all wet at the same time. It's one wash. So we have to work quickly once we start 
putting paint on the paper. And then remember, this was the place where we were going to finish up this edge with a little dry brush to suggest the sparkles on the water. And then we'll stop. You might feel like you want to do a little more with the trees. This is not the time to do it because you know if you work back into a wash that's starting to dry, you risk creating blooms. Now you might decide you want to create blooms to create the suggestion of some foliage textures, but that's that's a different project. Well, just for this one, we're just going to lay our wash and quit. Now I can also, at this point, go over and do my kayaker. That's a separate little bitty wash. This was all one connected area that was wet. Now I have to make a little jump because there's nothing connecting my kayaker to my cliff. So now I'm going to practice a little bit and if you want you can trace your kayaker again over on your sample piece of paper. I'm going to treat mine like one of those brush drawings. I'll make a couple dots for the head, a little brush mark for the kayak, and I don't even mind that little white. I kind of like that paddle blade, another paddle blade out here. Notice I don't even really need to show the paddle. And I'm looking at that thinking, yeah, that works for a kayaker. Let me see if I can do that again. Let's find another little blank page. So I made a couple of dots for the heads of the kayakers. I made a little smoosh brush mark for their bodies, a little stroke for the kayak seen from behind, and a couple of paddle blades. There's actually a third paddle blade visible on this on the um, photograph, but I think this is enough to convey kayaker. So you can fill in your um, silhouette that you traced very carefully, or you can try this too. Little dots for the heads, a little smoosh for the body, a little brush stroke for the kayak, paddle blade, paddle blade. That's enough to suggest a kayaker. So I'm, I think I'm going to just leave it at that and not try to go in there and fill my whole silhouette. So now we'll let that dry and we'll come back and talk about what we might want to do to finish this piece. All right, we're back and our next wash is dry. And you might see that I got a little bit of a bloom down here and I really like that. Um, I don't resist that sort of stuff when it happens by accident inside one of these silhouettes. It just helps us create texture. And as I look at this and think about what I might want to do, I'm not going to go, all right, let's see what's in the photo and try to copy everything in the photo. Instead, I'm going to look at this and say, what's working well, what's not working as well, and then I'll decide whether I need to refer to the photo for information. So I think my kayaker is working quite well. I can tell that that's a suggestion of a kayaker. My cliff seems a little bit pale and my trees seem a little bit sparse. So you may have been tempted to go in and fiddle with yours while, while they were still wet, but this is the time to go back and make those adjustments, to make another pass at it. So I think what I'd like to do is show you another method of creating tree texture, and we'll try to use that to fill out our tree line. All right, for this next little technique for suggesting foliage texture, you'll need one of these little Holbein watercolor spray bottles. I specify this one in particular because it's the only one I've found so far that does what I want it to do. It makes a mist if I spray hard. I'm sure you can't see that on the video, but if I spray hard, it comes out in a mist. If I just sprinkle or just press the um, plunger just a little bit, I get a sprinkle of water droplets. I'm going to see if you can pick that up on the, yep. You see how it makes individual droplets instead of a mist. And that's what I want, that pattern of droplets. So any little bottle that does that will work, but this is the only one I've found that does it consistently. So again, on a scrap piece of paper, we're going to try this out. I want to lay down 
And I don't think I'm going to be able to, to get the video to pick that up, but you saw it on the back of my hand. You can see a little bit of it up in the corner there. Now I want a fairly dark um, paint. It still needs to be fluid enough to run, but not too pale because you won't see the effect. And then I'm touching, trying to touch mostly the droplets themselves and not the paper too much. And you see the paint moves out where those little droplets are. Then if I get over here and, oops, that's dry paper, better not to go, oh, well, I'll just spray it again. If you keep spraying this, what happens is you'll just wind up with the whole thing wet and then everything will mush out and you won't get that lacy texture. So let's give that a try over here for adding a little bit to our, and it helps to tip your page to your lighting so that you can see where you're putting those little droplets. And maybe I'll see if I can suggest this. Fine. And then maybe add a little bit to this tree. I'm trying to just kind of drop color in onto those little droplets from the spray bottle. And I don't have enough up there, so I better just not fool around with that. If you're not, if you hit a spot that, that the paper's too dry and you're not getting the effect that you want, let this dry completely and come back and make another try instead of just adding more and more and more water to this because if I keep adding water now everything will just mush out. That's not bad. And now I'd like a little bit darker color down in my cliff so I can glaze over what I already painted Just a second layer of paint right on top of that first layer of paint. Again, I'm laying a wash, keeping it flowing all the way down the page. Wet edges, no stopping. And I'm not worrying about being too exact here. If there's a little bit of overlap, um, one brush stroke and another brush stroke doesn't overlap enough, that'll still suggest that rocky cliff edge. It doesn't have to be too precise. And then a little bit of the dry brushing to finish. And I think I like that better. So when you go to plan your own versions of this little exercise, look for something where the light is mostly behind the subject. So what we call a backlit subject, so that the subject is mostly seen in silhouette. I recommend you work from a black and white photo so that you'll resist the temptation to try to put in um, all sorts of little minor details. Your eye will pick up some very minute variations in color and value, but you don't need them and you probably don't want them. So let's dry this. Have a look at it dry. I think you'll see that it's a perfectly good scene without a whole bunch of color variation. All right, this is dry now. And one thing I want to point out to you is how Marks like this that are on the tape on the side, you don't realize it, but they really influence um, your feelings about the painting. They'll make you think that it's a lot rougher and cruder than it actually is. So when you get to the point where you're ready to evaluate this piece, go ahead and peel the tape off. If you decide you need to work on it some more, you can put tape back down. 
or at the very least get a paper damp paper towel and wipe off those streaky marks but we're going to just pull the tape by the way if you ever have tape sticking and tearing your paper warm up the tape with a hairdryer and th that will soften the adhesive and you'll be able to pull it off and there we go and that's quite a nice little get it straight that's quite a nice little painting. Um, I actually think I would prefer displaying that to the, the photograph because this has more atmosphere with the single color. And you'll find if you did yours in yellow or pink or another color that yours has a totally different feel. So you can even practice this exercise repeatedly. You can also try this over a graded wash. And you can begin as you practice and get a little more experience. You can begin introducing some color variation, but I suggest you do it by keeping this still one wash and then just occasionally picking up different colors on your brush and letting those colors mingle. And the viewer will imagine things and fill it in rather than you stating every little, little detail that's usually much more effective. So there we have it, a closer look at our little kayaker painting. Go ahead and give this a shot and plan some of your own. And in the next project, we'll actually introduce um, varying color within the same wash.